So I am excited to begin this evening's Rising Star Lectures. The Rising Star Lectures celebrate the best emerging skin science and scientists throughout the world. This year's 2018 IID Rising Star from the SID is Dr. Johan Gajonson. Dr. Gajonson is the Arthur C. Curtis Professor of Skin Molecular Immunology, the Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg Emerging Scholar of the A. Albert Taubman Medical Research Institute, and an Associate Professor of Dermatology at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He adds to the amazing legacy of outstanding clinician scientists developed and mentored by Dr. John Voorhees from this department, and he credits a lot of his success to both Dr. Voorhees and Dr. J.T. Elder, who has served as his primary mentor throughout his training. Johan began his education in Reykjavik, Iceland, where he completed his bachelor's degree and his medical degree. After the completion of his MD, he completed a PhD entitled Psoriasis, Genetics, Clinical Features, and Pathogenesis, which he successfully defended in 2003, where Lionel Fry served as his external, exa uh, external examiner, and um, Chris will, will agree to this, word has it gave him quite the grilling. Johan then relocated to the US and completed his residency and postdoctoral fellowship training in the Department of Dermatology at the University of Michigan and then transitioned to successful independence with a K award from the NIH. In 2013, he was awarded the Doris Duke Clinical Scientist Award. Since the completion of his K, Johan has held continuous funding from the NIH, the National Psoriasis Foundation and in Industry. He currently is the PI of two NIH R01s and is a co-investigator on an additional five grants. He serves as the associate editor for the Journal of Immunology and is the editor of the Journal of Psoriasis and Psoriatic Arthritis. He has published over 100 articles, including many, in publish, many published in Nature Genetics, Nature Immunology, Nature Communication, Journal of Clinical Investigation, and the Journal of Investigative Dermatology. Some of his most recent work, published in Nature Immunology, describes the role of a transcription factor in promoting sex-biased autoimmune diseases, which I'm pretty sure we're going to hear about tonight. It is my delight to introduce you all to the 2018 SID Rising Star, Dr. Johan Gajonson. Well, thank you, Nicole, for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm very excited to be here tonight, and I would like to thank the uh, organizers uh, for the uh, recognition and honor to uh, be given you one of those, one of the uh, Rising Star lectures. Um, so I'm going to be talking about sexual dimorphism and autoimmunity. Um, so just to kind of uh, give you a definition of what that actually is, uh, so sexual dimorphism is the condition where the two sexes exhibit different characteristics beyond the differences in the sexual organs. So this is, uh, this is the anglerfish. So it's a deep sea creature. Um, and for a long time, uh, and, and not much known about this, this species, but for a long time, the uh, you know, investigators and researchers couldn't figure out why the only, uh, that all the specimens that they found were all female. Uh, it was not until they noticed this, what looks like a skin tag on the back of the, uh, of the female fish that they actually found the male. So the male fuses to the female uh, and kind of uh, gives up all his internal organs and only provides sperm to the, uh, to the female. And that's, that's his whole function, his whole life. He's kind of stuck there. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure you all know about human relationships that kind of function pretty much the same way, but... Uh, <laughs> But this, this is an extreme form of uh, sexual uh, dimorphism. There are many more examples. This is the uh, ladybird uh, spiders. Uh, the small, pretty one on the, uh, on the left, that's the, uh, the male. Um, birds of paradise, same thing. The male is the other uh, colorful one on the left. And then, you know, things that we are kind of much more familiar with, like the peafowls. So you have the male, that's the, uh, the fancy one on the, uh, on the left, and then you have the uh, pea hen on the right. So after seeing these photos, you know, you obviously imagine, what, what about humans? Uh, obviously much more subtle, um, but there's some really interesting things going on. One of them is, is cancers, uh, and if you look at cancers overall, uh, they're about twice 
as more common in, in men compared to women. On the other hand, infections are about 1.5 to twofold more frequent in, in, in men. And usually when men get infected, particularly with severe infections, they, they tend to do worse. So they're more likely to die of sepsis. Uh, on the opposite end is, is the, uh, what actually is, is quite striking, uh, that about 80% of autoimmune diseases are actually found in women. And if you look at it, this kind of shows you the, uh, the female-male differences across a range of different autoimmune diseases. So on one end, you can see the Sjogren syndrome, lupus, scleroderma, even rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis being more common in women compared to men. Uh, but then there are other autoimmune diseases such as diabetes and, and psoriasis uh, where the, there's practically no sex, sex differences. If you take lupus as an example, and this kind of shows you the, uh, the odds ratio of, of the female gender or the female sex compared to the uh, top nine or ten of the highest, or the, the highest risk, risk factors for uh, systemic lupus. And you can see that the female gender alone carries about five to six times higher risk of autoimmunity than any other known genetic risk factors for, for, for our lupus. So it dwarfs all the other ones. Um, what are the mechanisms? Obviously, this is something that has been known for a while. Um, so there's been quite a bit of studies over the past few decades. Obviously, most of them have been focused on sex hormones. That seems to be the obvious target. And, and there's some evidence for that in, 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 in mice. So in uh, uh, lupus-prone mice, the New Zealand, uh, androgen inhibit and estrogen intensify lupus. And then there's a more recent study showing the uh, autoimmune regulator, uh, AIR, uh, which is a gene that is expressed in the thymus is down-regulated by estrogen and up-regulated by testosterone. Um, there are other factors, so X chromosome dosage, increases the severity of lupus in mice. Uh, but in humans, it seems to be a little bit more complicated. So you have uh, onset of many autoimmune diseases, particularly the sex-biased one, uh, before puberty and even after menopause. And lupus is often more severe uh, when it occurs in men. It doesn't seem to be any different in terms of disease severity. And then the other thing is that postmenopausal uh, hormonal therapy does not increase disease activity. Um, so, so clearly, uh, sex hormones may not be the only explanation for this. We have done, uh, my lab has, has done a lot of studies on, on, on uh, using RNA sequencing, so global gene expression profiling to kind of look at biological mechanisms. So one thing that we did, we had about 82 uh, RNA-seq data sets from healthy human skin. We had about 31 female, 51 male, sun protected skin, and we looked at the simple, asked the simple question, what's the difference between men and, and women in terms of gene expression in the skin? And what we found using a false discovery rate threshold of 0.1, uh, we found about 660 differentially expressed genes, and that's shown in that, that uh, graph on, the, uh, on your right, so with the female gene being shown in red and, and the male genes being shown in uh, blue, so the ones that are more highly expressed in women and men. As you would expect, the, uh, the genes on the X chromosome are more highly expressed in women, uh, and also the, uh, the genes that are more highly expressed in men are, are on the Y chromosome, but what's interesting is that that only accounts for about 15% of the genes. You have the other 80 to 85% scattered across the other 22 autosomes. Um, when you look at like X chromosome inactivation, that was obvious, you know, a, 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 a one potential mechanism that we could explain these differences. So if you look at, that's the, uh, the upper row of the other uh, data, genes that have uh, Y chromosome orthologs. Examples of that is like the DTX3X, DTX3Y, and you can see fairly clear differences between uh, female and male in the direction that you would expect. And then you can also look at genes that do not have Y chromosome orthologs such as the uh, linear non-coding RNA exist, uh, much more highly expressed in females compared to men. But X chromosome inactivation by itself could only explain about 15% of the total number of genes that we identified. When we look at the, um, the different biological processes that were, that were different between women and men, uh, we begin to kind of see some interesting uh, patterns. So one of them, if, if we look at the genes, uh, the functions that are more highly active in, in women, uh, that included uh, processes such as T cell proliferation, adaptive immune response, triggering of complement, and then phagocytosis regulation, key, f key immunological pathways that have role in multiple different inflammatory diseases. If you look at the ones that are enriched in males, you've got uh, more like transcription factor activity, 
and sequence specific DNA binding. And that involves uh, processes such as regulation of differentiation, morphogenesis, and system development. What was also interesting is that, is that um, not only did we find these genes to be uh, differentially expressed, we also could see that they actually uh, were, were kind of a group together in co-expression networks. Some of them involve uh, complement activation, T cell activation, and phagocytosis. And as you can see on the right, uh, in women, we had a strong correlation, correlation between different genes, uh, whereas in men, shown in the upper panel in, in blue, that correlation was lost. So those 660 genes that are differentially expressed between women and men extend much more broadly uh, across hundreds to, uh, to actually thousands of other genes. Uh, we looked, you know, we confirmed our findings uh, in, in an independent set of samples uh, using QRT-PCR. Uh, so again, we, looking, we focused mostly on the immune-related genes such as PATH, ITCAM, C3, CFB, DOC2, and, and FCR1G. And as you can see, we could confirm our findings by QRT-PCR in skin. But what's interesting is also that we could see the same differences being in other compartments such as B cells, T cells, and monocytes. Um, some of these genes that we identify are actually highly relevant to diseases such as lupus or BAF uh, is the only or only currently approved biological target uh, in, in lupus. And then ITCAM is a variant that is associated with lupus susceptibility. And then we confirmed our findings by looking at um, uh, by using immunosity cameras to, to see if the same differences that we found in gene expression can also exist in, on uh, the protein level. And we could see that in, in the female skin, we got more robust expression of these same uh, factors, including BAF, C3, and DOC2. Uh, obviously, having kind of seen these differences, we wanted to explore and, and identify, you know, how much of this could we actually um, attribute to the effect of, of, of sex hormones. So we looked at estrogen and testosterone. We kind of focused on the more of the immune-related genes. And none of the, uh, the, these two sex hormones that we looked at had any effect on the expression of these, these genes. Um, we also looked, and this is just focused on the, um, the females in, 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 in our data sample. So they kind of spread the uh, age from 18 all the way past 80. And we looked at the expression of these genes across age. So if this was a function of, of estrogen, you would expect that there would be a sharp drop of a, around the age of like 50, where the expression would actually go down. So looking at BAF and ITGAM, uh, we could see if anything, there was a, a slight upward trend uh, uh, over, over time and, and, and with age. We also looked at the immune-related genes and see, you know, have these genes been implicated in the pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases? And we looked at the uh, the enrichment and disease-associated loci are using a, 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 a GWAS data that have been published. And what you can see is that the, uh, the ones that kind of mapped up on the, uh, the top corner of, of those were actually diseases such as uh, lupus and, and systemic sclerosis, diseases that have very strong female skewing. Taking it a little bit you know, further, we also looked at uh, human uh, skin cells. Uh, these are keratinocytes. We have, uh, done uh, hundreds of these. Uh, so we looked at, you know, can we see this also in keratinocytes and cultures? And so these are keratinocytes that are grown and they're stimulated with type 1 interferon or type 2 interferon, as you can see on the right. As you can see, a baseline level, unstimulated cells, looking at key interferon-induced genes, uh, there is a, a very prominent difference in the expression differences between women and men in keratinocytes. And that difference is even made more will make greater when you actually stimulate these cells with either uh, interferon alpha or uh, interferon gamma. If you look at it more globally using uh, RNA sequencing, you can see that there's a huge difference in the, in the uh, number of genes that are induced in female keratinocytes compared to male keratinocytes. And that applies for both uh, type 1 interference shown on, on the left and type 2 interference shown on the right. Uh, and if you look at the other uh, 19 genes that are kind of overlapping with type 1 interference response uh, between male and female keratinocytes, uh, with red being more highly expressed in women, it, it's very skewed towards being more highly expressed in, in, in women. Um, so if you're studying uh, interferon-related processes in skin cells, uh, you, you, it, it's a, probably a good idea to start kind of uh, splitting it and analyzing the data, if, 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 depending on where your skin cells actually came from, whether they're male or female. Um, 
having kind of established and kind of outlined the whole, the whole difference is we wanted to figure out if we could identify what could actually be driving these changes. So we found tri five transcription factors um, that were kind of a, had that gender differences and we knocked all of them down using siRNA in keratinocytes. And looking at uh, three inflammatory uh, markers, ITGAM, BAF, and C3, there was only one that kind of consistently knocked all down, uh, all three down, and that's VGL03. And we could confirm the expression. It was about three to four times more highly expressed in, in skin and, and also in, in, in keratinocytes. Uh, these are transcription factors, so typically transcription factors are found to be, particularly if they're active, they're found to be localized to the nucleus. So we looked first in, in normal skin and, and we compared female and male. And you can see that on the right. And you can see that in the female skin, all the VGL3 is located to the, uh, the nucleus of the, uh, of the epidermis. In contrast, in, in male skin, it's much more diffuse staining and much more cytoplasm based. However, which we found to be quite interesting, if, if, if once you have lupus and lupus skin, uh, the expression actually goes up quite a bit. And now the difference between women and men in terms of uh, the expression or the localization becomes, uh, it becomes the same. Um, we, we looked at the, uh, the genes that are regulated by VGL03. Uh, all the uh, immune bias genes that we found in, in, in female skin were all affected by VGL03 knocked, knocked, knocked down. You can see that on the, uh, on the kind of the blue bar on the, uh, the left upper corner. Overall, we found about 200 genes to be regulated by VGL03, and about half of those have been implicated in autoimmune diseases. The other ones have been in, in, involved in cerebrovascular disorders and, and arthritis. And this graph that you can see, this branching graph, that's uh, kind of how these genes kind of group together, the VGL03 regulated genes. And many of these have been implicated in, in uh, various uh, autoimmune diseases. So uh, MMP9 has been implicated in lupus, scleroderma, multiple sclerosis, Sjogren's syndrome. You have uh, ETS1, which has been implicated in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. IL-7, uh, again, Sjogren's syndrome, multiple sclerosis and lupus. Uh, ITCAM is, is a known risk factor for multiple sclerosis and lupus. And then TNF-SFB13B is, is BAF. This is the only known and only existing biological target in, in, in lupus. We also looked and, and, and decided, you know, does uh, VGL3 affect type 1 and type 3 responses, interferon responses? So we looked at a few uh, interferon related genes. You have the type 1 interferon responses in, in the top panel, you have the type 2 interferon responses on the bottom panel. And, and uh, from this graph, you can see that VGL3 knocked down suppress both type 1 and type 2 interferon responses. It didn't completely abolish it, but it did, it did suppress it quite consistent, consistently. Um, this, this, is, this is early data that we are kind of still following up. So what we're trying to identify the factors that actually regulate uh, VGL3 expression. Uh, one clue uh, that we have so far kind of stumbled on is, is, is that it looks like it's epigenetically regulated. We've been looking at the H3K27 trimethylation. This is a mark that actually silences the, um, the expression of the gene. And if you look um, at the top part, the M1 and M2, that's male 1, male 2. You can see that in the promoter region that I've marked with a red box, you can see this kind of very sharp peak. So that means that in males, this, the expression of VGL3 is silenced. In females, uh, F1 and F2, uh, there's, it's partially silent, so it's not completely turned on. But in patients with scleroderma, um, the, uh, the breaks are completely off. And this is in, in peripheral blood uh, mononuclear cells. Um, and you can see the input control on the bottom panel. So it's fairly good evidence that it's epigenetically regulated, although we have barely, I think, scratched the surface of what, what, what's going on. Another thing that is, that is interesting is, is uh, you know, if you have a factor like this, what happens if you overexpress it in mouse skin? So we used the keratin-5 promoter. Uh, it directs the expression of the VGL3 up into the epidermis. And when we did that, after two to three weeks, uh, the mice began to develop um, a quite striking inflammatory phenotype. They got redness on their ears, the dorsal paws, on the tails, uh, in, in almost like a photo-distributed kind of a manner. In this model, we, we turned on the expression of the VTL3 by about 20 to 30 fold, so much higher than you would, you would get under normal circumstances. 
And you can see from the tail skin and the ear skin that we're getting both changes in the thickness, scaling, and, and also like pigment irregularities. And these pigment irregularities actually are from an interface dermatitis with a pigment dropout. So it's reproducing some, some of the same features that we can see in cutaneous lupus. And you can see the histology in the, uh, the right upper corner where you, the junction between the epidermis and the dermis are a little bit blurred. That's from the inflammatory infiltrate that is causing apoptosis. You can see that apoptosis uh, by using the tunnel, so it's localized to the epidermis. We're also seeing deposition of immune complexes in the skin. So again, these are features that are fairly classic for cutaneous lupus. And I, I encourage you to see uh, my, uh, uh, my postdoc, Dr. Liang, is, is, is publishing more. We're going to be showing more data from this model uh, on Friday in the, in the uh, concurrent mini symposia. So just to kind of summarize, um, so the mechanism behind sexual dimorphism in human immunity is poorly understood uh, and incompletely explained by influence of sex hormones. Uh, in human, there's a marked gene expression differences between female and male skin, uh, and influence of sex hormones only explain a very small fraction of, of this variation, particularly on autoimmune-related genes. Uh, the VGL3 regulated gene network is a novel pathway in sex-biased autoimmunity. And we can show using the mouse model that activation of this network in skin is sufficient by itself to activate an inflammatory phenotype having a very strong resemblance to cutaneous lupus. Um, so just to kind of uh, wrap up, I want to acknowledge my, um, uh, my, my, my um, members of my laboratory and, and colleagues that have been working with me. Almost all this work that you saw today as was, was done by Dr. Yun Liang. And I strongly encourage you to see her talk on Friday. I also want to thank Dr. Sarkar, who is a postdoc in my lab. Uh, Michelle Kallenberg is a rheumatology colleague uh, that I've been working with very closely over the past four years. And, um, and we have a very strong focus on, on autoimmune skin diseases, so hopefully more to come. And then Dr. Soy, Alex Soy, who has been uh, my bioinformatic person, and then I want to also thank Dr. Bori, who has been extremely supportive of me for those 15 years that I've been at Michigan. And then I, will, I want to thank uh, the rest of my, uh, my lab as, as, as well. And then lastly but not least, also all the uh, foundations and the institutes that have supported my work over, over the years. So thank you.